Welcome to the Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Acheson. Clearly, there is a need around the province to have conversations which nurture and foster our provincial soul, our community soul. <clears throat> there's a lot of attention to youth, there's a lot of attention to economy, and there's also a lot of attention to the political process. But somehow it seems that conversation never comes together into a combined vision for what the province could be and a direction we can all share on how to get there. Today's guest helps bring his voice, his passion, and his awareness of how we can do that together. We're really pleased today to have Matt DeCourcy with us, a man of many hats, and you never know it by looking at him because he's so young. He's had all kinds of experiences, and we're happy to have him here today. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much for having me, Dennis. But still enough hair there. <laughs> I've learned not to wear a hat every day. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So we can begin anywhere we want to begin. And um, how about you tell us about your passion for play and dealing with um, other cultures? Sure. Yeah, I, um, over the last number of years, uh, I've been working with the Child and Youth Advocates Office out of Fredericton, but really... Um, serving as uh, an advocate, as a voice, as, as an amplifier of the voice of young people in the province of New Brunswick. And we have lots of connections to, uh, to other similar offices around the world, specifically through La Francophonie, so Francophone Europe and Francophone Africa. Cool. Um, when I entered that office, one of the themes that we started upon was the, the whole idea of a, of a child and a young person's right to play. And that includes their right to free play, their right to be involved in recreational activities, mm -hmm. in leisure time, in rest, which we all know is equally important to their, uh, mm -hmm. to their growth and development, as well as the, the importance of being involved in the cultural and artistic life of, uh, of their community. So, so to interrupt, so when you say play, yep. um, does that include video games? Does that include, um, like can you give a, a range for it? In general terms, uh, people play and, and they don't, we've lost the definition or the sense of play. I would, so uh, I would think of it in two it ways. Yeah, I'd be happy to. I, I think of it in two ways. Um, uh, at the very early stages of life, you know, in, in a young child's development, we're talking about uh, that child's ability to be involved, uh, playing with, with different, um, uh, different pieces of uh, 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 toys, blocks, uh, learning how to be creative on their own. Now we've got this whole technological kind of influx sure. and, uh, and what we were saying often is we got to provide more opportunities for the child to be away from screens, uh, to learn on their own, to be outdoors. Mm -hmm. And that translates what I believe into more leisure and recreational opportunities and enjoyment for young people as they grow and develop. So, so that's really where the focus is. So the play that you have in mind is somewhat social. Yeah, absolutely. It, okay. Absolutely, and, and I wouldn't profess to be uh, an expert uh, in, oh, no, in, in no. psychology, no. No, in, no. Uh, in, in any of these fields, but, but we know that play is foundational and fundamental to the physical, social, psychological, and sure. emotional development yeah. uh, of young people. So I want to flip that on you a bit, because we don't need to defer to experts, because we're all experts. That's we, right. We all know how to play. We just need to keep tapping into that. Um, a story from when I was raising my boys. I remember Pokemon cards coming up, and uh, they were big fad and stuff. And some parents were very much against Pokemon cards. And when I watched my guys start to play it, and there were seven or eight, nine, somewhere in around there, I had the math skills, the English skills, the social skills, the sharing skills. Yeah, there was sometimes because it's a competitive game to a degree, but they would sit for three hours and they're doing math. They're doing all these calculations in their head about these powers versus those powers. And I've got this defense and I've got this strength. And, but it was play. It was much fun. And, and there's elements of uh, cooperation and creativity that are developed through those sorts of things as well. Um, so you know, with all these opportunities for young people to sit in front of screens, um, I think it's more important than ever to, to provide young people places outdoors in their community to play. You know, we could talk about, uh, we could talk about road hockey or pulling the basketball court out onto the street and the trouble that that has caused in some communities. So, fun riff. 
So the once, once upon a time, we could go out on the street and play soccer or play hockey and argue whether or not the puck hit the post or didn't hit the post because the post is a boot. You know, that's right, that kind that's of thing. right, yeah. And, and all that kind of dynamic that goes. But there's so many laws created now, by laws, mm -hmm. by adults, to inhibit that opportunity to have that free play. The premise is safety. That's right. But so does the Child and Youth Advocate Office, do you get involved with that kind of dynamic to create those spaces so that... Well, there's no doubt that, I mean, safety and security uh, and, 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 you know, just that sense of well-being is important, but that, that includes opportunities for young people to be creative. Uh, you know, speaking personally, I think to get into a little bit of mischief and learn from those experiences and mistakes, and I think uh, it's important for community members to be patient with young people who are living actively who are being creative, uh, who are just playing and getting along with one another. We, we have to have patience for kids uh, playing street hockey, playing basketball, uh, playing capture the flag yeah. throughout people's backyards, as I can remember doing when I was young, you know, I'd jump, like scaling over the fences and, yeah. uh, and running between all the neighbors' yards. We have to have space for that within our communities. So squirrel moment, but it connects. I'm imagining some people in the audience when listening to you thinking, yeah, yeah, and what about vandalism? Because about the mischief thing? Right. What about vandalism? Because uh, play could take many forms, like spray painting, like graffiti and stuff. And there's, there is a mixed blessing with uh, the graffiti culture in any community. And it, is it defacing or is it professional artwork? Because you can go into some cities and they've incorporated graffiti into their cityscape. That's right. And in other cities, it's it's n no. <laughs> well, um, so do you get into those issues too? As an advocate, do you do you push for or try to get the community to loosen up for that space, or do you? Well, I'll um, I'll use the example of you know graffiti as you know modern art. Uh, and that being, uh, in some instances, a very strong and strength-based approach towards, uh, you know, providing opportunity for maybe a young person at risk. So, mm -hmm. a young person who may have had encounters with the law, who may be experiencing some sort of mental health challenge, providing them an opportunity to express themselves in that way um, mm -hmm. can be therapeutic, uh, can be a recovery and rehabilitation tool. Yeah. Um, wouldn't it be an interesting if uh, municipal governments, uh, with the help of the Child and Youth Advocate, had uh, as part of their programming um, graffiti artist uh, montage or wall or something? Um, I think of Banksy. My boys have taught me about Banksy, who's a world-known graffiti artist, and now makes statements that way. It's all evolved from what he was doing in his teens and being right. in trouble to right. um, a world stage artist using these large cityscapes. But right. we're off the tangent a bit well, from your play uh, thing. But but, uh, but I think the lesson there is is we need to have time and patience, and we need to have more uh, empathy and understanding for the different ways that that people express themselves. And I mm -hmm. think that you could find lots of ways to. Um, to make that point, all kinds of different examples could be used, you know, aside yeah. from just uh, graffiti so, or so modern street art. Yeah. <laughs> so here's another intersection of things. Um, if you've got more uh, physical activity opportunities for youth, so when you say child youth advocate, first thing I think of is helping them when they're in trouble mm -hmm. or I'm speaking on behalf of people who don't have the resources to do it. Mm -hmm. And here we are talking about physical activity and well being. Mm -hmm. So um, one of New Brunswick's biggest challenges is obesity. Right. Is there a connection? So does the Child and Youth Advocate Office have a understanding or intention that if you increase more spaces for youth to play and structure that 20 years from now that's going to have a different culture in the community? Absolutely. You know, I think we'll have uh, a much more physically and mentally well population. Um, uh, we know that play increases confidence in young people, so we'll have uh, a generation of youth who are more apt to speak out on different important policy decision matters province-wide. I also think having uh, a physically well um, generation will will help with you know some of the financial burden on healthcare costs in a small province like ourselves. I think we have no way forward but to promote healthy and active living through play for young people. And you'll see uh, the whole participation, uh, social marketing piece is back. Organizations uh, like Canadian Tire and others are putting an emphasis on play. Um, and, and I think 
that's a good thing and, and we like to think in some small way we had a part to play in, in generating and getting some momentum behind that conversation at least here in New Brunswick. Mm. And of course there are all kinds of community organizations who play an active role giving kids opportunities for play and, and you know we'll, we'll be reminded from our conversations so far that play isn't just physical activity it's not just sports but it's all kinds of our artistic impressionation like dance and arts and crafts and mm. leisure includes reading and, and we also have to provide space for rest you know yeah, I was gonna get into that the yeah. unstructured element to it you know do you find there's an unstructured element because some people might be thinking you know a registration for hockey is declining or soccer registration is going they might think in terms of the program delivery right and it occurs all the time in backyards or on dead-end streets or absolutely the unstructured element and, uh, and so I guess there is a difference between unstructured play and recreational activity, which we mm. tend to think of as more, you know, structured. So that's where your organizations are providing, you know, soccer mm. teams and hockey teams and, and you what, think, what it might be. Do you think adults have overbuilt it? Uh, in a lot of ways, I think that we can overprescribe to kids uh, when it comes to play. Um, and, and that's an important part of the conversation when you talk about coaching. And I've done coaching. Uh, been involved coaching kids, coaching young adults, and it uh, becomes very apparent when you try to set something up that um, that that kids may have been bred to be prescribed what to do, and uh, in many cases they need to be provided with opportunity for free license to go out and figure things out on their own. You know, a basketball team needs to figure out how to score a point with five seconds left. Mm. Soccer team needs to be able to scramble to put a goal away late in a game. I think. Um, I think it's important to, to let young people know that they can make decisions on their own and that translate into, translates into the world. Uh, that's where play, I think, translates into recreational activity in a yeah. way. So tease into that a bit more because there's something that happens when that team figures out their own play and you might have a story or two about um, coaching and working with young people, trying to, whether it's here in Canada or whether it's somewhere else. Sure. And, and you've watched that transformation happen in a person where they figured it out. Right, and so that kind of holistic figuring of it out, uh, I, I think, you know, generates and creates a sort of team cohesion, and, and that's kind of a metaphor for, for what can happen, you know, in community as well as community tackles something yeah. and they kind of figure it out as they go, and there's a whole uh, cohesive process that takes place. Uh, you have I've, a for instance? Well, I, you know, um, I, I really, am on kind of uh, a view right now that we need to provide young people with more opportunities to take part uh, in decision making practices uh, when it comes to our public policy, provincially, municipally, federally. Uh, I think young people have a lot to offer. Uh, young people are at the forefront of a number of different uh, social issues. Um, I think young people see a potential for communities to become more inclusive. Uh, I look back on my experience coming mm. out of high school, and and we were we were we were a great you know we were, we were great and we were progressive minded and, and we thought and, and we were that. engaged and yeah. and thought we were inclusive. But I look at some of the young people who I get to interact with today on a daily basis, and they're so much more empathetic of differences, uh, w you know, amongst amongst their friends and peers, and they're so much more interested in understanding newcomers to the region and understanding the realities of First Nations youth um, in, in our region and, uh, you know, are much more accepting of young people uh, who face different mental health challenges. And I, I think if we can allow young people to play a, a, a stronger role in decision making, um, we'll have a much more inclusive and cohesive, uh, you know, public enterprise, I guess. Do you, uh, following that theme, do you sense that they have an awareness, so it's your perception of their awareness, mm -hmm. of, uh, that they actually have a voice and they actually have a, an ability or an opportunity to influence that policy? Um, some people will be disengaged. Go, well, what's the point? Uh, a middle-aged man in a suit isn't going to listen to me mm -hmm. compared to I keep telling them and telling them and no one's listening. Right. So, so do you think that they're engaged to the level that that they'll uh, be the change? I think I think that they are engaged. It. You know what I think of to, to give it a for instance is the students in Quebec last year. Yeah. They protested for seven or eight weeks. Right. Because they didn't want their tuition to go through the roof. Right. You know, reportedly a yeah. hundred thousand of them. 
That's never been seen before in Canada. Mm -hmm. Talk about an engaged group of young people trying to have an influence over their own, right. their own world. And agree or disagree, they force people to listen to them. Um, what, I, what I think is that young people are engaged uh, and, 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 and they want to be listened to. They want to be, inv they want to be invited to the table and, and not just one or two token young people to be a part of the process, but they want to be invited to the table. And, and I think what happened in Quebec became fairly divisive, but I don't think that that is the, the modus operandi of, of young people in general. I think they want to be inclusive and cooperative and work with others to achieve good yeah. things. Yeah, and just because they don't accept the status quo, well, that's nothing we haven't seen before for some of us of a certain age, because sure. the 60s and early 70s were all built on that status quo doesn't work anymore. Sure. Yeah. The uh, Idle No More movement or the Occupy movement, regardless of how portrayed by the media, had a whole other kind of energy around it that sort of speaks to what you do. And in a way, it's a form of play. They're trying to reinvent a, that's right. a system or a vice system. I'll give you I'll give you an example uh, from from one of my experiences and how play and particularly drama is used as kind of social development and social enhancement. I spent um, five months in the Gambia, which is a tiny West African country, working with an organization called the Nova Scotia Gambia Association, and they're a little organization based out of Halifax who've been in operation for close to 30 years, now fully staffed with young Gambians in country providing health education uh, yeah, health education to uh, school-aged kids and, and young people in community. Um, so, so what they do is uh, they develop workshops uh, based around a certain health sensitization theme. So malaria and behavior change around how to prevent you know, malaria contraction. Okay. Uh, sexual reproductive health and how to better communicate and change behavior uh, to avoid, you know, uh, HIV and AIDS, uh, and then how to, you know, how to just embolden the community to deal with these two issues, and and what happens quite often is you develop teams of young people who are trained with the knowledge, uh, and then they are given the opportunity to develop to develop drama uh, skits to then go out and sensitize the rest of their community. So. So there's a couple of things that you see there. One, the idea of play is used as you know, the social development piece, but also it's young people that are leading that social development. Um, and more and more often, young girls are given the opportunity to take part in those activities and then provided more opportunities for education. And that is really where the social development and the social enhancement takes place. Yeah. Are any of these plays by any chance on YouTube somewhere? Um, they they would be available through the Nova Scotia Gambia website, okay. uh, and 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 there you could see uh, on their website or through Facebook. But you really get a sense of the way that uh, young people performing a skit can 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 rally a community together. I, I can recall Dennis, uh, <laughs> and 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 so there's there's the live drama aspect, but yeah. there's also the recording of these skits by the young people. Yeah. And we would be in a truck, and we would go out into some small village in the middle of nowhere, play loud music for about 20 minutes, and all of a sudden, <laughs> the whole community would be gathered around us to watch a skit uh, delivered in the Mandinka or Fula or Jola language uh, in in that community, uh, which would speak to how to better prevent. Um, yourself and your family from from contracting malaria, and then if you do, how to uh, how to treat it. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, it was it was really empowering to see. You know, and, and I've said it a number of times: young people lead that process. Yeah, how fascinating, eh? Mm -hmm. You're saying this, and I'm thinking, yeah, Shakespeare did something similar about uh, kings and queens and governments and rule because it was theater or for me Shakespeare was street theater right it was right in its day it was always flipping it on its head about um, people taking care of each other or how crazy the upper classes were <laughs> with how they beat each other up so much so the power of, of theater and play and then the creation of it all and um, we'll put up um, when we get to show up on YouTube we'll put the link to uh, yeah the Nova Scotia bunch so if people want to go see some of these things that's, that's why I asked to be good fun so all of that stuff in, in another country, does any of it translate back here at home? Um, I, the idea of, of developing teams of young people to lead initiatives, I, I think uh, we see more and more um, in, in different school-based programs, especially ones that I've been involved in since I, 
started working here. I've I've been doing a lot of work with UNICEF uh, okay. Canada and their rights respecting school initiative. And essentially what that is, is kind of a culture shift in the school to take the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child, ah. where, where the right to play is enshrined for every single right. child in the world, and, and take that document, that, that living, breathing document standard that we have set for ourselves in every country in the world, except the United States and Somalia, and say, uh, we are going to abide by children's rights in every decision we make in the school. And that doesn't mean that we're giving children the rule of the roost, yes. but the, we are providing them a voice and they are going to be part of making decisions that are in their best interests and that are in the best interests of the whole educational community. Um, so, so one small way that that happens after the uh, school administration and the teachers and the entire staff are kind of trained in the basic knowledge of what are children's rights and, and how does that translate into the way that we teach and learn in the school and the way students participate in decision making in and outside of the classroom and the way that you know the school governs itself to ensure that we abide by those rules is that we set up uh, a committee of students who ensure that the rights respecting school is just that, mm. a rights respecting school. Mm. Um, not only is that very empowering for young people to be delivering the message about what their rights are, but they also learn how to deliver a message about not just what my right is, but why it's important for me to respect the right of my peers. So uh, I know that I have a right to come to school and learn. Mm -hmm. uh, I also know that I have to be nice and friendly and caring to my friend and peer who sits beside me because they also have that right. And the teachers in my classroom know that we have that right, but we can also only enjoy that right if we listen to the teacher in the classroom. Yeah, you're, you're speaking to a, a major theme, whether it's uh, youth-oriented or adult-oriented, that whole notion of rights. Yes. Um, implicit in behind it when it gets applied tends to be uh, competitive. That's right. My rights are better than your rights. Um, and that gets to be frustrating exercise, and, but you're also speaking to how it's all connected because everything's all connected. Yeah. It reminds me of a, a story of a reporter who did a piece about interviewing Pierre Elliott Trudeau after he'd retired. And Trudeau uh, explained that he and some other retired leaders having worked on world conventions for rights in mm -hmm. different areas, was, we're now working on a world convention for responsibilities. Right. And that, so the way you spoke about it, yeah, I have a right to be a certain way, but it's not insular, no. but I have a responsibility to share with all these others. Yeah. And it, that's a great conversation to have on a world stage or in a school level stage. It really is. Because a lot of the times um, we haven't nurtured that. Play does nurture that. Yes. Um, but in a social context, in a school setting, we devolved, to me it's devolved anyway, into rights. And rights get competitive or it gets uh, confrontational. So we need we, to learn how to be respectful of one another yeah. within that context. And, and you're speaking to that nice balance between the two. I think that so. I have a, Tommy Douglas would say, um, I have to protect my neighbor's rights in order to protect my own. Well, that's how you build an inclusive community where everybody is able to be heard and, and and uh, and enjoy their right uh, mm. to be heard. Mm. Um, so what a fascinating job you have then to wander around the province and uh, help foster the play element and the shared rights element. You know, there's, there's kind of a dual aspect to the way that we ensure that children are provided with as many opportunities as possible that are in their best interest for the sustainability of all of our communities. And that's by fostering that conversation um, amongst uh, young people and their adult allies, so teachers and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and support workers in schools, and as well as speaking with government about their, their responsibility to ensure that policies, decisions, and laws are, are developed and implemented in the best interests of children. And I think those both meet at a certain point. Uh, you know, government can't just decide that, that we're going to do everything in the best interests of children unless children understand what is in their best interests and that their family members around them understand that, yes, we have a responsibility to make sure that, that we understand that language as well. So I think there's, what we're hoping is that at some point, everybody will see their role. And I think that's a very holistic uh, and, and positive way to look at uh, ensuring that uh, we have a socially just, uh, economically vibrant, and environmentally sustainable province and, and a place where all of 
our citizens are, are happy and healthy. Mm. Funny, one of those big statements, but it's real though. It, it the really passion is, is real. I'll, and I'll just maybe I'll I'll, I'll reduce the grandioseness no, of that no, statement no. just for a second and <laughs> and talk about rights respecting school as a way to reframe the debate. Uh, developing a rights respecting school as a way to reframe the debate about how to develop a school that uh, is anti-bullying. So instead of talking about anti-bullying and about uh, you know uh, punishing bullying behaviors, we're talking about developing respect and repairing relationships and and developing understanding about the importance of relationships with young kids. And, and I think um, at the very at its very uh, elementary level. Uh, that's important. That's an important educational and preventative step to build better, more positive relationships and, uh, and healthier learning environments. Interesting, because sometimes the solution is in a direct line. That's right. And uh, sometimes the, the real problem is over here, and then that will take care of itself. Well, it's, it's, it's an upstream approach in a way. It's a grassroots and an upstream approach in yeah. a way. And, but, um, uh, you know, research has been done as to the benefit of that type of approach and, it, and it's, proven, uh, to, it's proven to increase and enhance positive behavior among students. It's also proven to uh, have a positive impact on, um, on the way teachers feel about their school and, and their professional enjoyment in coming to school. So, you know, if you have a classroom that is fun, is respectful, that has opportunities for play, You've got happy adults who I think are really that much more <laughs> apt and, and able to nurture young people. That's a great point. Yeah. You know, that's a great point. The uh, responsibility on both sides for developing the culture in the school and uh, the energy in the school. It takes a little bit of um, uh, it, it takes a bit of a brave person to launch into that as well because it is a bit grandiose in a sense. It can be a bit nefarious and a bit intangible, but I really think. Uh, it's it's all about a culture shift and about you know empowering not just the young people but their adult allies, family, and community members to mm. to to really focus on the best interests of you know of of, of young people. Yeah, is there an element of uh, we focused on schools mainly? Is there an element of the same thing in the community-based sector? Yeah, so much buzz happens in community through the voluntary sector. Sure, um, I mean you know the the buzz word around that would be child-friendly cities. Okay. How do you develop a city that is that is child friendly? And I think the same principles apply. You know, businesses need to act in ways that are uh, respectful <laughs> of children's rights. So when they see a 13 year old coming through the store, they aren't necessarily trying to shoplift. That's right. Not always. <laughs> not always. Um, now, you know, there there are instances where I'm sure some business owners have felt that that's the case, but. Uh, you know, there could be something else going on with that young person. And how do you invest in wraparound supports within communities to ensure that those young people are uh, are looked after and, and have, you know, supportive eyes on them instead of, you know, condescending and uh, suspicious eyes on them in community. A place where that sort of culture is working well is in the Acadian Peninsula in New Brunswick. And if you look at the statistics, the Acadian Peninsula criminalizes far fewer young people in our province than any other region um, in New Brunswick. Uh, and, 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 and there's a lot of research going into why is that exactly. But uh, you know, the, the evidence that we've seen is that you've got community tables that invite the education sector, uh, the social development sector, the environmental sector, the business sector, policing, uh, and everybody, the artistic community together to talk about how can we best support young people and if they, you know, they get involved in some sort of deviance, how can we provide uh, a strength-based approach to keep them in community and back on a positive path. Yeah, so it started with a large-scale community conversation. That's right. Everyone had the same focus to a degree. That's right. <clears throat> That's pretty awesome. You know, and how do you, how do you, how do you enhance your community by, yeah. by giving young people opportunities yeah. to be there and be well? Yeah. I have to admit, there's always a piece of me that cringes, but respectfully cringes. When, because uh, we have all types and it takes all types, but that, that need to study it and that need to measure it, mm -hmm. for me, comes after the moment when it already happened. So to go back and study it to find out why that happened, you'll capture the elements, but you might not capture the magic for, because it'll come from an emotions. Or flipped another way, community can go ahead and do it tomorrow and don't need your evidence-based policy to do it, although it's nice to know, right. because you're going to feel it. 
because yeah. in every community is going to have that feeling. So you're yeah. after a feeling, not after a statistical probability. Well, there's you know? an intuition <laughs> to when we're doing things right. Yeah. Um, and, and, and You'll I just know your community's happier. There's something good just happened. Quite, quite often those things are proven in, in research if it takes place afterwards as well. Yeah. I, I, I think it's important to have uh, evidence to, in which to base decisions. I, I, I think that's important, but, but you're right. There's a whole level of intuition and just uh, an intangible knowledge that something is working. Yeah, be because your work fits into a larger context. And sometimes you know, whole communities struggle with how to get past or how to get where they want to go. Right. So I remember interviewing uh, someone on the idea of a social planning mechanism. It was 10 years ago. And he was in charge of uh, bringing businesses from other parts of the country to, to New Brunswick. And what's your biggest obstacle? And his first response was education. Right. So he wasn't even working within tax base or labor uh, resources. Or No, he went to the school system because people didn't want to come move here because the school systems weren't on par with other parts of the country. So you couldn't get companies to move because the employees would go, well, but I don't want my son or daughter to lose a couple of years of school. So he needed a place to go have that conversation like they have in the Acadian Peninsula right. with all those different people around, but they're all sharing a vision for the community and what role they have in it to make it happen. And I think learning and education and, and maybe learning and innovation is the theme that, that links a lot of these conversations together. How do we make sure that that our communities and the people within our communities are provided educational opportunities, whether they be formal or informal, yeah. uh, and that they be offered from a very early age right through to the end of life, yeah. and that they be given, again, you know, relating back to the theme of free play, they yes. be given opportunities to explore and, uh, and take certain risks, and I think that falls into this, the conversation around you know, being innovative and providing some license for uh, entrepreneurial-minded people to, to test their ideas. And, yeah. and then who knows, maybe that intuition of what's working appears and then we find the evidence later on that, that proves it. Yep, and, and then you can uh, repeat it or try to franchise it. But, but it's always the way you can have, if using the play analogy, you can have a diagram for a play or the, <laughs> and it'll be different every time you go to play the darn thing. That's it's, right. So you gotta have a, an awareness to being in the moment, but to do that on a community-wide scale, which means the community needs to have those moments, whether it's community-wide conversations once a year or once every six months. Or right. So that happens on a team because, you know, the team is allowed to coalesce over a certain amount of time, and then all of a sudden you've come up with the miraculous play that yeah. happened because you were cohesive, and I think that's a good metaphor for what needs to happen in community. Community needs to see itself as, as a team where, uh, and, and I believe, you know, strongly all different, you know, uh, parts of the community need to prov be provided with a voice to take part. Yeah. They all have a role in it. Absolutely. Okay, so to add a bit of tension to this conversation would be the political turn. Sure. Because a lot of people would see um, politics as the very thing that stops that from happening. <laughs> because uh, this province, f to a certain general degree, mm -hmm. as, uh, it's red for a little while, then it's blue for a little while. And so these contracts go this way and these contracts go that way. And that's a tough way to build an economy when there's a certain swing to the pattern. But some people b would say it doesn't matter who's in power, <laughs> it's, it's always the same schmozzle. You kind of represent a new way of approaching and a new way of thinking of that whole process. So, it, so as you did your work as a consumer advocate, did anything to it stop or get jammed at the political level without you know, giving away, I just realized if I'm jamming you up a little bit, or, or you saw that that's exactly the next place that needs to change. Um, well, the, the Child and Youth Advocate has a mandate uh, uh, that provides an opportunity to recommend so to government. So it's apolitical to a degree. It's an autonomous, apolitical organization, uh, and, and we make recommendation to government on what we believe is in the best interests of, of, of young person or young yeah. persons. Um, the ultimate decision rests with with uh, government, and, and, and there are financial considerations that I think prevent you know the the utopian uh, solution yeah. from being achieved. But what we're saying is, the more and more you think about investing in good decisions for young people, I think uh, the more you see the replacement cost later on uh, and, and much lessened. Of what, and much of what you shared so far, it doesn't involve a lot of money. 
No. It's just about people getting together. That's right. But there might be an ideological block. I know that uh, you know if there's one party in power and this is their vision, their mandate, four years later, eight years later, that changes. That's right. um, when speaking with Randy Hatfield at a Human Development Council, and it's one of the shows that's on YouTube and stuff, Randy will talk politely but with energy about how every time it changes, I got to start from scratch. And yet the social issues at play, which integrate everybody into the solution, don't change. Right. So it would be interesting um, about how the political process, like do you have a vision for how that political process might change to, to take it to that next level, but in that arena, as opposed to what you're already familiar with on the community level? Um, you know, the specific actions are one thing, and, and I, we talked a lot about things being iterative, but, uh, and, and so to answer you that way, no, I don't have a specific answer for how things need to work better. What I do uh, believe in and value a lot and have had some experience in it, and it served me well, is in being available and patient to listen to people and encourage dialogue. And I think that that's where, uh, if you can bring uh, community members from from a different uh, backgrounds, different perspectives, different political stripes together to listen to one another and force them, and force is not the right word, but encourage <laughs> them to be patient uh, and, to, and, to, and to come away with a better understanding of one another, we might have better decisions yeah. made that, that last us a little longer. You know, there's, 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 there's talk about the poverty reduction strategy in New Brunswick, uh, and and the merits of its success versus its kind yeah, of they're in the measuring phase now exactly yeah. uh, but I think by and large the process of bringing uh, the leadership the government leadership opposition um, people with lived experience uh, the business sector and yeah. all other levels of community to together to best deliberate about how to how to develop a plan was a real good process. And, and I think the more and more we practice that type of process, yeah. the more positive results we'll see. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we talk about reducing harm to children and, and we think the best way uh, to ensure that, that harm is prevented and that they're provided opportunities to be educated and, and play again is to have young people themselves at the table, their adult allies, the business sector, government, uh, the opposition uh, parties all, all sit down and talk about this as, you know, a 15, 20 year vision of what we want the province to look like. And that's the question I think we have to ask. What do we want this province to look like? And individual communities have to ask themselves, what do we want our community to look like? Yeah. And uh, if, if you can listen to one another and get to some a vision of what you want that to be, then maybe there's more opportunity for uh, collaboration over the long term without, you know, the, the instance of, you know, we tend to throw the baby out with the bathwater when a new um, government is elected. And, and that can be detrimental and that can set us back a long way. And I think that only enhances, that only enhances, sorry, divisive politics. And we want to get away from that. Yep. So I'm going to completely make the political turn. So um, you're going to be running as a nominee in the next federal election on behalf of the Liberals, so you're at the front end. Uh, you're if on, nominated. Yeah, if nominated, but That's you're in right. the contest to be one of the, yes, one of the nominees. So yes. part of the fun of this interview is well before the fact, so who knows what November will bring or December right. will bring. <clears throat> but a lot of people in general, for the sake of the show, don't get to see what motivates people to come in to want to do public service. Right. And we don't even call it public service <laughs> anymore. We don't give it that, that respect, that here's someone who wants to serve the community in that capacity. Um, we have another view of, in general terms, we have another view of politicians. So much of what you've shared very much builds to um, what role do you think you can play as, as a federal MP? Sure. Uh, you know, I, I, I come by wanting to provide voice, and not just for young people, but for different vulnerable populations. I come by that honestly, and that comes through my upbringing with a father who worked in probation services for young offenders, so young people who were in trouble with the law, and a mother who was a methods and resource teacher, so young people with different educational challenges. I had the opportunity to work with Andy Scott, a member of parliament from Fredericton, who was a, an incredible champion for people with different disabilities, and as well as First Nations um, uh, people, and specifically young people, providing them opportunities. I think 
I think just ahead of, of when the conversation turned into a national conversation, and I still think that's happening, but yep. I believe as a non-First Nations, non-Aboriginal person, uh, he was at the vanguard of turning that into a national conversation. Um, and then, you know, having had the opportunity to travel to West Africa, uh, to experience the way that people care for one another in their communities, despite what little resources they might have, and how they value um, uh, time together. Um, I've been able to bring that lesson back and, and, and talk about you know, the role of community. It's going to be really counterintuitive. I mean, most of our culture, to generalize again, is, is built on the stuff we have compared to I have a great connection with my neighborhood, <clears throat> but I don't have as much stuff. <laughs> There's a lot of people in our communities who don't have much stuff. Though. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and, and another we project... We don't share very well. Uh, probably we not we as well we as do. we could. Yeah, exactly. We could learn a lot by, by visiting we, we, well, I'm other riffing places. We've got everything we need. That's we right. Just, so you want to do a poverty reduction strategy? Share. <laughs> yeah. Just share and, and across the board. No one needs a strategy. But the intent or the heart has to come from, imagine bringing that to politics. That's right. Yeah, and, and I think that's, that's just what it is, right? We need to, we need to invest with our heart and, and, and with, with, our, with both hands together and give people the opportunity to share with us what their concerns are as well. I mean, one of the issues that we've been working on for the last year was uh, developing a better mental health I'll say system, but really it's a collection of all the parts that we already have as well. Yeah, yeah. And you know, there are, there are clinical approaches and there are research approaches and there are government investments that can be made. But at the end of the day, uh, what seems to be most important, and again, this is what I think is happening with play, is the social transformation that can take place so that it's okay for young people to sit around at the table, uh, talk about on the phone with others, you know, the idea that we're not always in our best mental state and it's okay to talk about mental health challenges yes it's okay to well, do that we all have a version of that we're human that's right that's right <laughs> Highs so, and lows. so do you think a politician could make a difference because that's almost counterintuitive in some ways the role of politician and, and it's generic has uh, almost evolved as a status quo so we play around the edges but economy fluctuates two to three percent, unless there's an anomaly like 2009. Um, growth rates don't change, but even that's one, like growth rate in the economy is gonna have to stop at some point because it's a finite universe with a doubling population. And so maybe it's a distribution economy instead of a growth economy. Also, so do you think the politician makes a difference or does this politician maintain the status quo? Does change come from a politician? Or well, change can only come from, from the politician. And, and I'll, I'll go back to using the word the public servant, right? Because I really think that that's what that's what that representative is. If the, the change can only come if they take the time to listen to the diverse uh, voices and opinions around them and then are able to represent those in a fair way amongst all the other voices that exist uh, brought to the table by all your other uh, public servants or representatives. Mm. Um, I, I think I think the term advocate uh, works here as well. Okay. And um, and and my my version of what an advocate truly is 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 someone who makes sure that an issue is at least presented in a fair way amongst the larger discussion. An advocate doesn't doesn't try and force an issue into prominence or force a solution, but they make sure that the issue is on the table and that if a dialogue can be encouraged, that it's given its fair place before a decision is made. Um, you know, I, just in my experience in New Brunswick, we, we punch well above our weight in all kinds of, of, of different uh, areas, um, providing space for, 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 for the mental health conversation is just one such area. And, and we have uh, a Francophone population, an Anglophone population, we have First Nations communities, we have a vibrant newcomer community, we have rural and urban realities. We have so much to offer, uh, but we need a strong voice ensuring that what we have to offer is presented as part of the federal government's conversation on the role that it plays and the role that we play uh, mm. amongst our federal colleagues. And it's so much more than just economic development. Usually the media storyline is about a COA. So when they think of federal government, they think of Atlantic Canada, the next thing tends to be, you know, Atlantic Canada Opportunities Agency and it's economic development. And there's so many other things that are that come first. That's <laughs> right. Yeah. Which is what you're speaking to, the wellness of a community, the role the politician has. As you spoke, 
to the bringing voices to the table and having it be part of a long, larger conversation. I can imagine some people in the audience will go right away to the conflict or the cacophony that's going on with all those voices competing for the win so that their, their issue felt uh, it won, it got the policy change. Um, on a provincial level, I'm thinking of the minimum wage thing. Right. You know, a lot of work went into shifting that minimum wage and then a whole bunch of work went into the pushback from the in federal uh, independent business bunch. Mm -hmm. uh, that conversation needs uh, a solution because both had good merits, right. but still nothing happened. They canceled each other out for a six month window and then minimized it for the next year and stuff. You're going to sit right in that hot seat. So, mm -hmm. I, think, I think part of the challenge is not to be drawn into a false dichotomy that one thing has to be A or B. Uh, we, you know, to, to use the minimum wage example a little bit, you know, uh, if, if we heighten the minimum wage, then businesses have to lay off employees because they can't afford it. Um, so we, ha we can only do what we can only have these businesses operating or we can only have minimum wage has become the 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 argument that is understood i guess out in the media out in the community yeah. and it's oh. important not to get drawn into that false that's dichotomy a that's a great point and there's another issue that attaches to that which is the need for media reform because yes. the, the media keeps bringing that story back in that same dualistic approach can i bring it back to a focus on children do it uh, the fact that, that that children and youth have a right to be informed uh and 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 have a you know um an opportunity for objective information collection and, and that speaks directly to the role of the media in ensuring that they provide the type of information to young people and to the broader community mm -hmm. which will inform the discussion and not you know create once again I'll say you know a false dichotomy between A or B yeah. you know um, we all have you know, we all have uh, you know a lot a lot going on as as New Brunswickers, as Atlantic Canadians, and what we can offer uh, to the rest of Canada, and and it's important that we're we consider the conversation a Canadian conversation and not just New Brunswick as part of the Federation, right? I mean that that I think that creates <laughs> silos between what we want and what the next province and next yeah. province or next region want. We're all part of a country, Canada. Yeah. Uh, not part. We're not just a series of parts within a federation. Yeah. Um, I want to take another turn. We have about 10 minutes or so left. Wonderful. Um, you, uh, I kind of focus it on you. So in general terms, Joe Q Public will have an election happen. They'll speed in the media or see on television, here's the candidates. And you'll do your best to tell your bio. That's right. Uh, you know, and you'll have 30 words here or 100 words there uh, on a brochure. And, and uh, <clears throat> what never gets spoken about is what motivates or encourages people before the fact. So that's the moment we're in now, is before the fact. Like, why do you want to do this? And I, the sense I get from you is, is that notion of public service. But you're talking 1950s and 60s mindset about what, what public service was compared to how Joe Q. Public sees a politician nowadays, which is more like self-interest as opposed to public service. So you want to bang on the public service drum a little bit? Um, I you know, I think what interests me to do it is, is the idea of public service, but what interests me to do it now specifically, you know, at a relatively young age, and, it, you know, there's, there's been a lot, lot of uh, public servants younger than me who have been elected to office, especially recently. Yep. Uh, I, I, you know, I think the diversity of experience I've had for, for someone in their early 30s um, gives me an understanding of the complexity of a lot of different conversations and a lot of different public policy implications out there and I think it's important to have someone with the ability to understand the diversity and complexity of things as opposed to someone who comes to the table with a specific wedge issue that they care about um, and I won't say to the exclusion of but to maybe priority over yeah a priority yeah. over a lot of other things I mean I I see uh, a real connection between having a robust socially just um, system in place, uh, the connection between that and, and a vibrant economy and, uh, and development within community that creates jobs and opportunities for people to participate 
in citizenship. Mm -hmm. You know, and that requires being able to work and, and make a living and provide for your family. And when uh, faced with health challenges, be able to access the, the health care system in whatever form it takes to be able to get back to work and to enjoy recreational opportunities and play in the arts yeah. and culture of the community. That's, that's all a part of it. So I, I, I see a real connection there. So and you see that as a role for, for the MP? I think the MP has to help ensure that communities are socially just, uh, economically uh, robust, and environmentally sustainable. Absolutely. Mm. Um, uh, and, and I think I have uh, a penchant for wanting to do that, uh, having come from a number of different experiences and using, mm. and using the things I've learned from all of those uh, mm. you know, to, to, to listen um, and, 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 and when a specific issue dis does come up, understand it from, from Com different viewpoints. Yeah, complex viewpoints. Yeah. Um, it's going to change, assuming a lot of other pieces fall in place for you, it's going to change your life a whole bunch. Yes, it will. <laughs> yes, it will. Uh, I'm excited for it. I mean, I'm motivated to be active. Uh, I love sitting with people. If I had the opportunity to, to have conversations like this away from the camera every day, I'd be happy to do so. Mm. Um, you know, I, I drink lots of coffee, so I'm okay <laughs> with that type of lifestyle. I've noticed. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm physically active and, and, yeah. and know that I can keep that up. I have wonderful support from, from yeah. parents and, and my sister and, and girlfriend and, and, and friends. And I feel uh, an intangible as well as tangible support from the community as well. Mm -hmm. um, and that's positive. Uh, and, and I hope that other uh, nomination contestants and other candidates get that same type of support because I really think it can enrich mm. um, the debate when it comes mm. to election time and and those things can get catty and negative but but I really think if you have people who come with strong support for the candidates and those candidates are able um, to to be inclusive of the the viewpoints of their supporters but as well as the viewpoints of, of other people's supporters then it can be a really enriching experience and so uh, to be honest, win, lose, or draw, I see this as a positive for myself. I, I see it as a positive for the political party I've chosen to, to seek election for, but I, I see it as a real positive for the community as well. Yep. The um, part of your uphill climb um, will be getting the public to understand it is possible for a person to go in with a cooperative mindset as opposed to the competitive uh, wedge issue kind of mindset. And... Uh, Shoot, I just had it. It was a really good point that you would slid in. It was about the, the divisiveness and about um, you can bring all the different points of view together in, in one voice compared to uh, I, uh, there are some politicians from the past who said, I was elected, I won, so I get to espouse my views. And so whether it was about gay rights, because there was a, an MP out of St. John that, you know, just stay home and shut up about it. Right. <laughs> and when challenged about that, um, her response was, I was the one that won, so those people voted for me because that was my view. And there needs to be a shift occur, and you seem to be representing that shift that it isn't your view, it's the amalgam. I hope that people would vote for me because they know I'll listen to them uh, when things uh, of importance um, matter to them. Hmm. Um, and, and I really think that, that a representative within a constituency has to represent the the collective uh, view of that constituency, and it can be very divergent, but, and, and if they can't represent everybody every time, they have to at least be willing to sit and listen and understand before making a tough decision. And, and you know, I, I wouldn't, I would never profess to, to be able uh, to satisfy everybody every time, but I would hope, and my hope is, is that people will understand me as someone who will listen and take the time uh, to as much as possible understand their view. Yeah, and in, in support of that energy, um, you'll need a community to shift a little bit from seeing politicians as get me what I want. Sure. As a vehicle to get what they want. Sure. Into understanding the role that their want fits into a whole milieu of other wants. I don't think I'm unique in, in this view of, uh, uh, of, of wanting politics to be done a certain way. And I'd, talk, I'd, I'd prefer to talk about it in community development and community enhancement to be done that way. I think there, again, if we, if we look to young people, and, uh, and you know, that could be very young to, to early adulthood and beyond, I think they want a more inclusive, uh, equitable, and fair 
uh, approach to decision making and, um, and and progress within their within their communities. Cool. Um, about a minute left. You got final thoughts? Well, look, I, I mean, I've really enjoyed this conversation, and and I know you always say, Dennis, but the conversation, in some way, is what it's really about. The action uh, stems from the conversation that you're willing to have with people, and 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 I truly believe that. And. Uh, to be able to start this about play and to have a playful approach to this conversation has been a lot mm. of fun. And, and and I think if I could leave people with one thing, it, it, it is provide space for for young people to be creative, uh, to, to get involved, to express themselves, uh, lose control of the message a little bit and, and, and allow people to find their own way and support them in that. That's awesome. Yeah. Thank you for this. Thank you very much. It was much fun. I appreciate it. So as always, be good, have fun, and love each other. Never.